A warm welcome to our evening service of worship and we seek the presence and the blessing of God as we unite for a little time around his word tonight. Let us begin our worship singing his praise from Psalm 81. Psalm 81 and we'll sing verses 1 to 8 and to the praise of God the tune is Paisley number 97. Psalm 81, verses 1 to 8. Sing loud to God our strength. With joy to Jacob's God do sing. Take up a psalm, the pleasant harp, timbrel and psaltery bring. Blow trumpets at new moon, what day our feast appointed is. For charge to Israel and a law of Jacob's God was this. We lift up our praise unto our God, our strength and our song. Psalm 81, 1 to 8. Sing loud to God our strength with joy to Jacob's God to sing. Take up a psalm, the pleasant harp, timbrel and sultry bring. Blow trumpets at new moon, what day our feast appointed is. For charge to Israel and a law of Jacob's God was this. To Joseph this a testimony he made when Egypt land. He travelled through where speech I heard I did not understand. His shoulder I from burdens took, his hands from pots did free. Thou didst in trouble on me call, and I delivered thee. In secret place of thundering, I did the answer make. And at the streams of Meribah, of the approved did take. O thou, my people, give an ear, I'll testify to thee. To thee, O Israel, if thou wilt but hearken unto me. In midst of thee there shall not be any strange God at all, nor unto any God unknown thou bowing down shalt fall. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray together. O holy and eternal God, 
Thou art the only true God, and thou hast said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And so this day we acknowledge that there is one God, and he is the Lord, Jehovah, the eternal God. He is the creator, he is the sustainer of all things, and we will bless thy mighty name. We will honor thee as Father, as maker of all things, and as the one pleased to call us again in Christ, his children by adoption. We will bless the Son, him that loved us and that gave himself for us, the elder brother who has compassion, the one that represents us as the advocate, the one who has redeemed us from all evil. We bless thee as the Holy Spirit, as he who works in our experience to call us with an irresistible call to make us thine own. We will bless thee, O our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, but one God the same in substance, equal in power and glory. And we magnify thee then. We bless thee in thy sovereign purpose. We bless thee in the fulfillment of thy plan. Oh, how precious to be the called according to thy purpose. Oh, then to believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Lord God, we draw near to thee this night, and our prayer is that thou wilt draw near unto us. Though we cannot gather in public worship, gather with us in private and in family devotions, and grant us a portion of thy spirit. We confess before thee that we have sinned grievously in thy sight. We confess our sins against the Sabbath day, we acknowledge that we have not kept this day altogether as unto the Lord, and we are grieved and saddened at that and pray that we might remember better the Sabbath. We acknowledge that we have broken all of thy commandments, and above all, we confess that we have had other gods, that we have above all put self upon the throne and worshipped our own desires and aspirations and made little gods even out of foolish man. O oh Lord, pardon these sins, cleanse us from them, and teach us a better way, we do ask. We are so thankful that there is a gospel. We are so thankful for a way of pardon, for a way of cleansing, and it is that way afresh that we would know and experience in our souls. O oh, grant us then light upon the word, grant us sweetness with it and in it, O oh, that we might hear what God the Lord will speak to his folk, he'll speak peace. Lord bless, we pray, each one of our congregation. We commit unto thee, she who is recovering after a bad accident and after recent surgery, that thou wilt draw near and minister to her now in her own home, grant her healing and restoration to her usual health and strength. Bless, we pray, our older ones, especially those that live alone, and grant them sweet comfort and companionship in thyself, even in these days of isolation. Draw near, we pray, to those burdened with the care of others. We think especially of those with near and dear ones who are heavily disabled, who need constant attention, or that they would have patience and compassion and love in these tasks and do all as unto the Lord. O oh, for parents amidst the many duties of the care of small children. O oh, for patience, O oh, for sweetness, O oh, for a, an example to set before these little ones of true and living godliness that will ever endure in the memory, that will have its own testimony and that will have its own blessing. O oh, Lord, we do pray a particular portion upon grandparents who are isolated from their families, and oh, we do pray that they would still know love, know family nearness, 
even as they are physically distanced. We pray thy blessing upon our congregation. We commit to thee our elders. We think of him who has been grievously unwell and continues in indifferent health, and we do pray that he will be blessed and strengthened of thee. We pray, O Lord, for our deacons, that they will be upheld in their practical duties. We pray for the ongoing work of our congregation, even that intangible witness and ministry within this, congreg- within this part of thy vineyard, within this island, and we do pray that that would be prospered. We pray for our children and young people, that thou wouldst draw them unto thyself while they are yet young, and especially that they will come to know the one who receives children, that they will know his sweetness, that they will know his love. And oh, we do pray that they will not get entangled with the world, but rather that they will find Christ. We do pray, O our God, that thou wilt bless each one. We commit unto thee especially our own denomination, We pray thy blessing upon our church. We think of committees. We think of the presbytery, which is to meet this week. We commit them into thy care and keeping, continuing our work by means of teleconference. We pray thy blessing upon the moderator of our church and the principal clerk as they navigate these uncharted waters. We pray particularly for wisdom in the governance and rule of the church, And especially that we will remember that Christ is king and that his church is independent in spiritual things of the state. And therefore that we would have the wisdom to defer when it is right to defer to the requirements of civil government. But that we will not do so in a slavish or a servile spirit. And that we will remember that independence of judgment which is ours. O Lord, bless then thy cause. Build thy church. O for revival across our land. O for an outpouring of thy spirit. For reformation of the churches. For awakening of the dead. But even for sanctifying of the Lord's people. For O God, what a poor witness we are. And how cold and indifferent we are as believers. O remind us of our first love. And return that blessing to us again. Continue with us now as we gather around the word. Grant us a sweet portion in it. And comfort us in thyself. These things we ask with the pardon of our many sins. In Jesus precious name. Amen. Let us turn now in the scriptures. In the Old Testament. To the book of Exodus and chapter 12. And we'll take our reading from verse 29. Exodus chapter 12, reading from verse 29. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord, as ye have said. Also take your flocks, and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men, 
beside children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt, and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt (coughs) was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof, In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is home-born, and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. And it came to pass the selfsame day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their army. And that's far our reading in Old Testament Scripture. We'll read further in the New Testament in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. The first epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. Let's hear the word of the Lord. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything 
give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen, and the Lord bless. The reading of his holy and inspired word, to him be the praise and the glory. We'll turn now to sing from Psalm 58. Psalm 58, and we'll sing verses 6 to 11 to the praise of God. Psalm 58, singing from verse 6. Their teeth, O God, within their mouth, break thou in pieces small. The great teeth break thou out, O Lord, of these young lions all. Let them like waters melt away, which downward still do flow. In pieces cut his arrows all, when he shall bend his bow. <clears throat> we'll sing Psalm 58, verses 6 to 11, very solemn words, words of imprecation, calling down the curse of God upon the enemies of Christ. But here is Scripture, and we join in Scripture, and we approve the will of God, and so we do sing these words, and we seek to pray them from the heart that God indeed would have the glory for the day of judgment is also the day of salvation and of glory to all of the Lord's people. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Their teeth, O oh God, within their mouth break thou in pieces small the great teeth break thou out o lord of these young lions all let them like waters melt away, which downward still do flow. In pieces cut his arrows all, when he shall bend his bow. Like to a snail that melts away, let each of them be gone. Like woman's birth, untimely, that they never see the sun. He shall then take away before your pots the thorns can find both living and in fury great as with a stormy wind the righteous when he vengeance sees 
He shall be joyful then, the righteous one shall wash his feet in blood of wicked men. So men shall say, the righteous man reward shall never miss and verily upon the earth a God to judge there is. Let us now turn again to that passage of Old Testament scripture from which we were reading, that's Exodus chapter 12, and we'll take our text for tonight in the words of verse 51. Exodus chapter 12, and reading again at verse 51. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And it came to pass the self same day that the Lord did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Tonight we come to the defining moment of the Exodus. We come to the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, and the deliverance, therefore, of Israel out from their bondage and slavery in the land of Egypt. The deliverance of God's people achieved in blood. And as we see that deliverance, let us lift our eyes to that deliverance which we have as God's people achieved in blood. I am not directing your attention this night to a merely historical incident to the origins of the Jewish nation, nor even to a vital stage in the development of God's covenant dealings with his people. It is that. It is the national deliverance, but it is so much more. I direct your attention this night to your own deliverance, to your own redemption, from your own sins by the blood of Christ. I call you to witness as the Lord's people that here is your experience. I call you to examine and to search yourself whether you be one of God's people, whether you have indeed known this transforming and life-changing step. Here is, in a word, redemption accomplished. And for a few moments, that will be our theme this night. Redemption accomplished. Let us look to the hole of the pit whence we are digged. Let us see from where we come as the people of God. Let us look to Calvary and see there the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us. And let us see, what does that mean to us? Is that our hope? Is that our confidence? Is that our deliverance? Redemption accomplished. Now we'll consider that theme under three heads. We'll consider firstly, the death of the firstborn. Secondly, the deliverance of God's people. And thirdly, the declaration of the law. So firstly then, the death of the firstborn. Well, it had been a long time in coming, this culmination of the plagues. And yet, how awful, how fearful, what a judgment to come upon any land for the firstborn to die in every 
single household. It was solemn indeed. It was fearful indeed. But let us see that this was a judgment that Egypt had earned. Egypt had done something dreadful. They had enslaved the Israelites and had kept them, not just for a short time, not just for a few years. 430 years Israel had sojourned in Egypt. More than four centuries had elapsed, and for the great bulk of that time, they had been a slave race. They had been bond servants, giving of their labor and receiving nothing or very little in return. They were a slave race. And that was a fearful and a dreadful thing. Slavery is abominable and loathsome. And God hates that as he hates all forms of cruelty and persecution and exploitation. None of us may justify such things from the scripture or from the truth of God. We're hearing a great deal about the slave trade at the moment. We're being challenged about, for example, the statues that are allowed to adorn our cities, the statues in some cases of slave traders, Colston in Bristol, removed from his plinth and hurled into the harbour. And of course, it's right and legitimate that debates be had about such things and that the statues of a city reflect the values, the morality which we prize as a Judeo-Christian nation, which has on that basis rejected the slave trade. But I do worry with all this talk that we lose sight of who the real enemy is. The real enemy is not other people. The person who has hurt you most, who has damaged you most, is yourself. And I'm not saying that to minimize any hurt or harm or prejudice or discrimination or trauma that you may have suffered. But you've been enslaved by yourself. You've been made a slave to sin. You've been degraded and humiliated by yourself. And you've worked and labored without wages under that willful guide of yourself. You have lashed yourself with that whip that says, be happy, be contented with this life. You have lashed yourself to try to achieve contentment in the world. And then when you had some sense of God and of his holiness and of the demands of his law, and then you lashed yourself all the more, make bricks without straw. Be righteous without the Lord Jesus Christ. You have enslaved yourself. And as the Apostle Paul writes, Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Sin leads to death. The wages of sin is death. And here was a nation which was itself enslaved in sin and which had enslaved others in the same corruption. Egypt's judgment had been warned of. Egypt's judgment was a long time in coming, but at last it came. Oh, how fearful. Verse 29, it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. How extensive a judgment. How fearful the judgment. Even the very cattle losing their firstborn. Here was national judgment. Here was catastrophe. Imagine the parents waking up on that morning, all the same, all as usual, and coming to the bed to find silence and stillness and pallor and coldness and unresponsiveness 
their beloved child. Dead. Actually dead. Peace and safety. That's what people say. Peace and safety. And then sudden destruction cometh upon them. You know, the day of the Lord is a day of judgment and a day of glory. A day which for the lost, for the goats, for those without Christ is the worst day of their lives. A day for the godly, for the exercised, for Christ's, for true Christians, which is the best and most wonderful day of their life up to that point, but only the beginning of the far more glorious days which are yet to come, days that increase in glory without end in their experience of God and of godliness. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment and of final eternal salvation. This was joy, joy to Israel. For at last it was deliverance. But oh, how fearful to be an Egyptian on this day. And what a cry arose from their houses. Friend, if you're inclined to doubt the reality of hell, if you're inclined to say, oh, well, I don't think that a God of love would send people to hell, I want you to come with me to Egypt on that night that glorious, wonderful night, that night celebrated in worship by Israel ever since, to that night, the Passover night, the beginning of the year, the Jewish calendar, the beginning of days. Come to that day and see that God killed children on that day and they died. There is a hell that is to come. We have a solemn God, an awful God, a fearful God who hates sin, who judges in blood. And his judgment is solemn and fearful indeed. Let us not trifle then with him. If we recognize the reality of hell, let us prepare to meet our God. Let us flee the wrath to come before it is too late. Will you not? Take some thought for your darling, your soul, your most precious possession, more precious even than your firstborn child, your spiritual self, your future experience for all eternity to come. Will you not give thought to that and take some care for it and seek now to Christ? Because see that the judgment was in all the land except in Israel, because the people of Israel were sheltered under the blood, a substitute had died, and so they did not die. Their children lived and woke that morning warm and contented and breathing and responding in love to the love of their parents. It was a day of joy and of new life and of new liberty to the families of Israel, for the substitute had died. Make no mistake, it was a costly deliverance. It was a deliverance purchased in blood. And how much more the deliverance of your soul purchased in the blood, not merely of human flesh, but purchased in the blood, in the broken body and the shed blood of the divine Son of God, of the God-man, the mediator Christ. Think that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God has paid the price so ask yourself the question, now this night, am I trusting in Christ? Am I safe in him? Is my faith in the blood of the God-man? Is my trust in his mercy? Is my hope in his compassion? Is my confidence in his sufficiency? 
Am I trusting in Christ or am I not? Search and see. There is no more urgent or vital question this night. There is no more urgent or vital question in all this world than to know your standing in Christ. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Search your own selves and see. Are you trusting in the Savior? Are you under the blood? Is he your hope? If so, then the day of the Lord holds no fear. The coming of Christ is but the coming of the sweetest joy and the most glorious communion because it is that joy, that communion, which you have begun the experience of here. Search and see, do you trust the Christ? That then is our first point, the death of the firstborn. Secondly, the deliverance of God's people. What a transforming effect this last plague had. In a moment, in an instant, the bondage was broken. That stubbornness of Pharaoh that had endured through nine previous plagues at last crumbled before the horror that had reached every family in the land. The cry of Egypt, that cry which had entered even his own household in the death of his firstborn son. That anguish, that death broke at last the bondage of Egypt and thus granted Israel freedom. The message was, verse 31, rise up, get you forth from among my people. Take your flocks, take your herds, be gone, go serve the Lord and bless me also. He recognized at last the sovereignty of the God with whom he had been dealing. He, Pharaoh, who accepted worship as a God, he, Pharaoh, who worshipped the gods of Egypt, all were humbled and brought low. They were broken in the dust before the power of the God of Israel. Here was bondage broken in an instant. And you know, this is the experience of the child of God brought to see the cross. It is the cross that breaks the bondage. When you see Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. And it is when we come to the cross, when we see death, that at last we realize there can be no other way. There can be no alternative if it cost God this much. And so we see the beauty and the wonder of the grace of God in Christ. We see that there is the hope and the only hope of pardon and of salvation. And so we are driven to trust him and him alone. Death justifies. Death, the blood of the Lord Jesus, is the assurance of the pardon and forgiveness of our sins. Death adopts for it declares the love of God for us and his determination to make us his own. Death even sanctifies, for by that death we have the great example set before us of absolute dedication and obedience to the will of God. And we have it commended to us, that example, by the awesomeness of the gift of the life of Christ for us. Oh, the power in the death of Christ. In an instant, that old bondage, earn salvation, work, make bricks without straw, be righteous without grace. In an instant, that bondage is broken. It was amazing, isn't it? Israel had worked and worked and worked. They tried to do everything. They had built for Pharaoh these treasure cities, Pithom and Ramesses, they had tried at last to make bricks without straw. But it was in death 
that they found deliverance. And so it is with you. You've tried and you've tried. And it was in death that you found reconciliation and peace with God at last. It was a bondage broken in blood. God had redeemed his people. Blood had been shed. And a people had been purchased and obtained forever to be the Lord's. Is this your experience? Have you known the power of the death of Christ? Oh, if not, then pray the Lord to bring you to Calvary, to give you such a sight of the cross that like pilgrim and pilgrim's progress, the burden rolls off your back at the sight of the cross and into an open grave. The bondage broken. The bondage broken. And consider further the journey now begun. It was a remarkable journey. Israel were to go forth from Egypt to the promised land. They were delivered out of the land of bondage, but before them lay countless miles of desert. And so it was a courageous, indeed a faithful action to thus go forth, trusting in God, trusting in Moses, the preacher of the truth of God, trusting in the word of that living God, trusting in the power of God to sustain them all the way, going into the wilderness with the Lord in the midst of the company. Here is the believer. Here is the believing journey. Have you commenced this journey? You know, there's a lovely detail recorded here in verse 38. We're told that a mixed multitude went up with them. Isn't that fantastic? It wasn't just the family of ethnic Israel, the actual lineal descendants of Jacob. It's more than that. There was Egyptians who had been captivated by this same God, who had learned the fear of him. There were other strangers who had flocked, who had found their hope in this God and who now joined themselves to Israel. It was a mixed multitude. And in that mix, the Lord had his people. Isn't that precious? To see Gentiles gathered in. To see those who are by nature aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of grace made near by the blood. And so it is with us Gentile believers who begin on the way. A mixed multitude, yes. Foolish, weak, ignorant creatures, ill-taught in the things of God, hardly knowing what we were doing. We look back at the beginning of our Christian life and we shake our heads in amazement that with such ignorance of the truth, with such ignorance of ourselves, that we did indeed begin, but it was the Lord who began a good work in us. And praise God, it is the Lord who has sustained us and kept us thus far. What a precious journey we see begun. Here is the deliverance of God. And notice a further detail, the favor that the Lord gave. Verse 36, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent them jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. They did not go up empty-handed. They had labored without wages, and now at last they received some measure of payment. They received some benefit and some blessing. Oh, what sweet blessings are to be found in Christ. He is no man's debtor. There is no poverty in the Lord Jesus, but riches and wealth. I'm not saying that there are no anxious times. I'm not saying that you will not have times that you're driven to your knees in prayer. What I am saying is that there is riches to meet the need, that there is provision to sustain and uphold in material things and spiritual things alike. We have a wealthy Savior. And oh, how precious. He turns the hearts of kings. He turns the heart even of our enemies. 
lives and makes them to be at peace with us. How precious the favour of God. And that is what Christ has obtained. And that is what in the Passover the people experienced. Communion, yes, with one another as families, but communion above all with their God. And in the experience of that favour, oh, what sweet blessing. Have you known, have you tasted the blessings of following and serving this God? Can you relate to these experiences? Oh, follow then the Christ. Pursue after him. Turn not aside after the baubles of this world, for there is gold in the Lord Jesus. That then is our second point, the deliverance of God's people. Thirdly, let's see the declaration of the law the declaration of the law it's in this chapter that we start to see the law of god being revealed the national law for israel which was revelation from god and of course that's quite appropriate here is the beginning of israel as a nation so here is the beginning of the law of Israel and the great source of that law was God. But what rich teaching that is contained in that law. One aspect of it is in verse 39. We're told they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened. There was the wisdom of God in commanding them to make unleavened bread. They would not have time to allow their cakes of bread, their loaves of bread, to rise in the ovens. They were therefore to make, as it were, wafers, flat bread, bread that was very simple, very straightforward to bake, and involved no time to allow for it to rise. Unleavened bread. The simplicity living light to this world, not so entangled by the affairs of Egypt that they were stuck there in their homes waiting for the bread to rise and that little window of opportunity had passed to join the people of God who were departing. There's a lesson here, isn't there? Purge out there for the old leaven. Live light to this world. Purge out sin. Live light to the sinful things of this life. Make sure that you're not so entangled by this world that it distracts you from faith in Christ. Oh, let us be sure that on that last day, we are not, as it were, when Christ is calling, stuck watching the oven. How fearful it would be like Lot's wife to be found looking back when we are being called out. Unleavened bread for Israel. What about our hearts? Are our hearts unleavened? You see the spiritual depth in the law of God. Further aspect, verse 42. The Passover was to be observed not just on this one one night only. It was to be a recurring annual observance, the beginning of the Jewish ceremonial calendar. Verse 42, it is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Oh, friends, worship is not for the Sabbath only. It is a constant and ongoing thing. If you have been saved, if the Lord has done a work of grace in your heart, that obedience to him, that worship to him, that expression of faith in him, That is ongoing, that is every day, that is constant and continual. He is your Savior, He is also your Lord, and He commands your faith and your obedience. Will you then follow Him in the obedience that He has commanded? Will you keep His law? Will you love His commandments? Will you perform His statutes? Will you follow him in the example of righteousness which he has set in the person of Christ? May it be so. May we follow him in all goodness and in all godliness as those whose hope is to live and reign with him 
in the eternity that is to come. One further aspect of the law we see in verse 47. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. This was a distinct and national observance. A foreigner, verse 45, and an hired servant were not to eat of it. Someone who just happened to be passing through the land, to be visiting in a family, they're not to eat it. They're not part of the people of God. They're not to sit down at the Passover table as one of the family, as one of the household. No, and a hired servant, that is one who is earning wages there for a time, likely to move on to another job in due course, they're not to participate as though they're part of the family of God. There's a warning here. The ordinances of the Lord are separating ordinances. They distinguish between those who are the Lord's people and those who are not. That is why at the communion, when the table is to be served, we warn against unworthy participation, against those coming to eat the bread and drink the wine who know nothing of true heart and spiritual communion with God. There is a division made within the congregation. And so it must be there is an important message sent out. Not everyone is welcome at the Lord's table because not everyone can rightly participate at the Lord's table. The question is, what of you? What of your heart do you know this communion with God? Do you trust in the Savior? Have you joined yourself to him? You see, there's provision here for people to join. Verse 48, when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he shall be as one born in the land. He could join the people of God. It was not a racist church. It was not a church with laws and rules that kept out people on the basis of race, there was an open door, but you had to actually come and commit permanently. So it must be, let us be holy as he is holy. Let us trust in Christ, not merely outwardly, not merely in word, but with the full heart commitment of the children of God. Oh, may the Lord bless his word to you, each one. May his redemption be sweet and be precious to you this night. Do you see in that death of Christ your hope? Do you see in that journey of Israel your experience? Do you see in that obedience of Israel your practice? Examine yourself and see there is no more question in all the world than this. We shall draw our worship to a close, singing his praise from Psalm 105, verses 38 to 45. The tune is Lyra, number 83. Psalm 105, singing from verse 38. Egypt was glad when forth they went. Their fear on them did light. He spread a cloud for covering and fire to shine by night. They asked, and he brought quails. With bread of heaven he filled them. He opened rocks, floods gushed, and ran in deserts like a stream. Let's sing to the praise of God, Psalm 105, 38 to 45, to God's praise. Egypt was glad when forth they went, their fear on them did light. He spread a cloud for covering and fire to shine by night. They asked, and he brought quails with bread 
of heaven. He filled them. He opened rocks, floods gushed and ran in deserts like a stream. For on his holy promise he and servant Abram thought with joy his people his elect with gladness forth he brought and unto them the pleasant lands he of the heathen gave that of the people's labor they inheritance might have that they his statutes might observe according to his word and that they might his laws obey give praise unto the Lord now you will remember the prayer meeting meeting by zoom on Wednesday afternoon at 1.30 and the services next Lord's Day at the usual times via YouTube, God willing. Let us conclude. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.